So, you know, when we look at a commissioning or pre-commissioning as a process, so uh, commissioning is, uh, you know, when you are doing the refrigerant gas charging and optimizing the performance and carrying out the refrigerant uh, leak test. Whereas preparing is something wherein you are ensuring that the, your system is something which is right and uh, appropriate for uh, taking the commissioning or the refrigerant charge uh, in it. So there are three aspects. So the first one is the process or the steps which are taken. The second is the tools which are required. And the third one is consumable what goes into the system or what is required. So probably I will try to cover on each step, uh, highlighting the tools which are required and what is the good or the bad part of different tool and why we need such kind of tool. And then also coming to the consumable, you know, what should be a good quality uh, consumable. So what would be a good quality refrigerant or nitrogen or uh, uh, other aspects. So, so this is a way I will uh, try to cover up and I may be slightly quicker because we have limited time. Uh, what we can do is if there is any question, you can either put that across into the chat box or you can uh, wait uh, towards the end of the presentation so that uh, I can handle it uh, once, uh, you know, the presentation is over. But if you can just keep putting it across into the chat box, once the presentation is over, I can definitely take those uh, uh, questions from the chat box. So as we talked about the three things, you know, process, tools, and consumables. So when we talk of the process, um, majority of uh, the work goes in preparing the system or the pre-commissioning. So the first one we're going to talk briefly about is the flushing. So flushing is, you know, when you are, uh, you know, if there is a compressor burnout or anything which has happened, say moisture or water gone inside the system. So when you are doing a rework on a system, uh, you need to flush the internal lines uh, of the system. So we'll talk about flushing. Uh, we'll talk about purging. So whatever is the flush or any other material or solid particles which are left inside, uh, we'll be talking about the purging. Pressure and leak test to ensure that the system is uh, intact. Then vacuuming and dehydration. What is the significance of that and why we do that, how to measure it. And then refrigerant charging. So what are the different tools and different ways uh, to charge a refrigerant, then uh, obviously leak test, which is uh, important aspect, and then performance monitoring. So various tools which are required for carrying out this is the manifold, the refrigerant manifold, vacuum pump, hoses, vacuum gauge, uh, core remover tool, charging scale, leak detector, and all. So we'll try to touch upon these. We'll not go into much detail about the tools, but we'll just try to touch upon these. And if there is any question for any specific uh, tool, then you can put that across into the chat box. And probably towards the end, we should be able to uh, take that on. From consumable sites, it's the nitrogen refrigerant leak locator is actually a sub solution uh, and vacuum pump oil. So these are the four key things which are required. There are some more, but these are the four key things which are required and we'll try to cover these uh, four in this uh, presentation. Uh, the first part or the first step is uh, flushing of the containments. Now, what are the flushing, you know, why flushing is required? Because a lot of time the compressor fails is because of the contaminated or a dirty system. So if there is a oil, acidity, moisture, uh, particles, these lead to the compressor failure. And after the compressor failure, the carbon or the deposits are something which are very hard to remove. So a proper flushing is normally required. So when we talk of, uh, you know, uh, flushing of a compressor burnout case versus a, a non-burnout case where there was a moisture or something or, a, uh, you know, water went inside the system. Yes, we do a flushing in that case as well. And what is also being done these days is what is called as recommissioning. So in a recommissioning, what you do is you flush the internal system because there is oil falling. So layer of oil, which is formed on your heat exchanger, evaporator and condenser. So if you remove that, you get a better capacity or, you know, enhanced capacity as compared to the current one and very close to the design capacity and efficiency of the system because this barrier, the heat transfer barrier is removed. Now, when we are talking of, uh, you know, flushing, 
earlier days, you know, the flushing was very easy because uh, CFC 11 used to be the flushing agent, uh, air refrigerant, and used to interact or, you know, was soluble with most of the oils and dirt and everything. So if you flush with CFC 11, you get everything from the system out very easily. And then CFC 11 will also leave out the system very easily because of its, uh, you know, the higher boiling point. So you can just quickly evaporate it or vacuum it and then uh, you are good to go. So the things were very simple till the time CFC 11 was available. But since uh, CFC 11 is now not available, uh, so we need to work for alternative uh, chemicals, which are now there are a number of chemicals just one cylinder is shown here uh, is something which is to give you an idea that yes there are uh, type of chemicals or you know flushing agents which are available in market you need to see what is the compatibility and you know how soluble it is with the type of the oil or refrigerant and all that stuff and also you need to consider while selecting the flush fluid is whether the residue of the that is going to have any adverse impact on the system so that is also becoming uh, critical these days uh, now when we are talking of flushing you need to uh, think from a perspective that you know flushing uh, of expansion valve or compressor is very difficult because there are restrictions whereas if you have to really flush take out the evaporator or condenser or you know isolate them and do the flushing separately. There are manual ways of doing the flushing and there are also uh, machines which are available which are shown here uh, on this. So these are kind of a recirculating equipment where you can actually do a flushing through a machine so that you know um, you are able to reuse the flushing agent and you are able to get a high pressure flushing uh, on a continuous basis. So you are able to have a very good result of flushing. So yes, both options are there a lot of time we use a manual flushing for a larger system. After flushing, what is another thing which is important for us is nitrogen pressure test or purging. Now, before I you know, talk about nitrogen pressure uh, test or something, uh, what is important from nitrogen pressure is it normally comes in a cylinder and the cylinder pressure is very high as compared to what our systems can handle. So what is shown in this picture is a nitrogen cylinder, which is typically having a 2,350 PSIG of a pressure. So what you need to do is essentially use, mandatorily use a manifold, a uh, you know, uh, step down uh, manifold, uh, by which you can regulate the outlet pressure. Now in this, uh, regulator you would normally have two uh, pressure gauges one will show you the pressure of the cylinder and second will show you the outlet uh, pressure and there would be an adjustment knob so that you can adjust the outlet uh, pressure with that this is something which is very very important because if your system is exposed to 2350 psi or uh, such a high pressure there is going to be an accident so uh, always use this type of a, a regulator and uh, you know when you are using this type of regulator uh, ensure that whatever is the out pressure which you have kept is not more than the designed test pressure of that system that actually depends upon the type of the refrigerant and the system design so a lot of times say for example for 134a it would be 134a for any system you will find this design pressure test or uh, test pressure for that system uh, from 200 psig to 350 psig so never try to cross uh, you know beyond that pressure and always try to reach that pressure uh, with nitrogen uh, for pressure testing now when we talk of nitrogen pressure test you know one of the additional thing with nitrogen you do is purging out so when we used uh, a flushing agent or even if you have not used a flushing agent or done the flushing, you have just repaired the line and doing the uh, without flushing the system. In that case, also always ensure that you purge the nitrogen uh, in the entire system. One, it takes out the any unwanted, uh, uh, you know, solid particles or, uh, you know, uh, 
also the moisture and unwanted gases. So that is something uh, which makes the system fit for or easy and quicker uh, for uh, us to vacuum the system and prepare for gas charging. Whenever we are using nitrogen, you know, we need to ensure that the nitrogen which we have, uh, we are, which we are using for poaching or for pressure testing is dry. So dry nitrogen becomes uh, essential because a lot of time the nitrogen which is available in market can also be a, a moist. So that is something become uh, important. Now, again, you know, when we are uh, doing the purging with the nitrogen, uh, we need to ensure that we are purging both the uh, evaporator and condenser. And when we are doing that, try to connect it to the uh, liquid port or you know near the expansion device and allow the refrigerant to escape from the compressor points. So inlet and outlet. So open those lines and let the nitrogen be flushed out so that your both the lines, uh, both the uh, heat exchangers are properly flushed. That is the, the place where there would be a lot of the contaminants. Now for pressure testing, you know, why we do the pressure test? Pressure test is done to ensure that there is no uh, leakage. We are ensuring that there is, uh, the system is going to run uh, for a very long life without any leakage. Now, what we need uh, for pressure test is a oxygen-free dry nitrogen as I talked of. Why oxygen free is because we never want to expose our system with uh, pressurized oxygen. Any gas, whether it is 134A, 410A or 22, all these gases in presence of high pressure oxygen, they are dangerous, they are explosives. So never use oxygen for pressure test or a dry air for a pressure test. Always use oxygen free dry nitrogen. So that is something which is very, very important. When we are using uh, the, uh, this dry air, we need to ensure that we reach the pressure test, design pressure test level, not less than that, not more than that. If we are having a pressure which is less than that means probably in worst case scenario, the system can leak because the design pressure test is something which is designed or optimized uh, for that specific machine. So no uh, test under that pressure and don't cross that pressure. So always be, uh, you know, testing in that pressure. If the pressure uh, falls, so if you have, say, for example, you have tested for 350 PSIG, and if the pressure is falling, that means it is likely that system is having a leak. So searching for that leak and repairing that leak becomes very important and critical. Now, if there is a leak, you need to also find that leak. Now, finding that leak with nitrogen, uh, it becomes difficult because for nitrogen, you will not get any electronic leak detector. So you need to, um, you know, most likely uh, going to work with uh, soap solution. So you need a good quality soap solution or sometimes you use uh, ultrasonic uh, uh, leak detectors where you are uh, checking for the noise of the leak instead of uh, finding the actual gas. So that also becomes an uh, important aspect to find leak. There is another thing which is there uh, in international market, not much in India market so far, is the nitrogen tracer gas. Now what is a nitrogen tracer gas? It's a nitrogen, 95% nitrogen with just 5% of hydrogen. Now, with just 5% of hydrogen, uh, this mixture uh, still remains non-flammable. But since hydrogen is a very small molecule, it tries to escape from the system very fast. And with the hydrogen leak detector, you can detect this leak out hydrogen. So with this, you know, say for example, when you are using a electronic refrigerant electron leak detector typically you can do a leak test of uh, you know the capability of those leak detectors would be one gram to three gram per year kind of a leakage from a single point they can detect whereas when you're using hydrogen uh, tracer gas and using a hydrogen leak detector uh, typically you would be able to find leaks of 0.1 uh, 
uh, gram per year also. So this makes, uh, you know, in some of the geographies, uh, it is becoming very popular to use a nitrogen tracer gas. Now in India, you know, people have tried uh, for nitrogen tracer gas with 5% hydrogen. So off the shelf, it is not uh, available. Whereas all these gas companies uh, who make uh, these uh, gases, uh, calibration gases. So calibration gases are, you know, a, a set mixture of gases. So there, yes, they do provide 5% uh, hydrogen with 95% nitrogen. So if uh, you have your, uh, you know, industrial gas supplier uh, who has capability of providing the, uh, you know, calibration gases, uh, probably he would be able to uh, supply you 5% hydrogen with 95% nitrogen. And then you can go for a hydrogen leak detector by which you would be able to uh, find even during the nitrogen pressure test. Uh, what's the, uh, you know, the leak point. The another important uh, aspect uh, is, you know, say for example, when we talked about uh, uh, nitrogen pressure test uh, at 350 PSI or whatever the test pressure, normally from an analog gauge, you know, which used to be the earlier days, with the analog gauge, uh, you were limited with the accuracy of the gauge. So a lot of OEMs used to recommend that you need to pressure test your system for 24 hours or eight hours to 24 hours. Now, this 24 hours pressure test is something which becomes too long. And if you wait for 24 hours and then find a, a small leak and then address and then again do the test, wait for 48, uh, 24 hours, this becomes a lengthy process. So nowadays, the digital gauges which are available for pressure test uh, is something which can give you uh, a estimation. So you keep the same reading as OEM prescribed that if there is a you know one percent drop in twenty four hours, then it is uh, acceptable. If it is more than one percent, it is unacceptable. So you put the same reading, uh, but because of the uh, higher accuracy of today's generation gauges you can estimate and you can find out that in you know 5 10 15 minutes that whether it is going to pass that 24 hour test or not so this is another advancement which has happened uh, from a nitrogen uh, pressure test uh, perspective these days uh, from nitrogen pressure test you know once the pressure test is okay you know you have a comfort it, the test is passed then you go for uh, vacuuming or dehydration Now, in vacuuming and dehydration, uh, the typical tools which are required is vacuum gauge because uh, measuring the level of vacuum is something which is very, very important. And also, there is to be a vacuum uh, leak test. Now, in a vacuum leak test, you leave the vacuum uh, at uh, whatever level you have achieved and you ensure that it does not reaches or crosses that minimum level in another 10 minutes, 15 minutes or one hour or so depending upon the criticality of the system and recommendation from the OEM. And then definitely what you require is a vacuum pump, a good quality vacuum pump and a vacuum pump oil. You know, there are different readings of uh, vacuum. Uh, typically in our refrigeration and air conditioning system, we use microns because with microns, it's easy for us to know uh, a, a deep down level of what is required and how uh, we have achieved. So in this table, you can see on the left hand side is the SI unit, the unit, and then what is its level in atmospheric pressure, then how it is as compared to one bar absolute, and then uh, preferred vacuum level, what we could achieve at that unit. So if it is a bar, uh, then atmospheric pressure, as we know, is 1.013 bar and absolute bar is uh, definitely one bar. And from bar perspective, what we need to achieve is 0 0.001 bar. In micron levels, uh, the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure uh, in microns is 1013250 uh, microns, whereas what we need to achieve is uh, 1000 microns. So microns becomes uh, important aspect for us. 1000 microns, 500 microns, 200 microns, depending upon 
uh, what is the OEM recommendation? We go for a uh, that level of micro. Now, what typically happens when you are doing a vacuuming? Uh, you know, you are essentially doing two things. One, you are removing the air or gases. Second, you are removing moisture. Now, when you are removing the air or gases, even if you achieve 5,000 micron, typically you would remove most of the air or non condensable gases. Whereas for removing moisture, you need to go beyond because, you know, uh, for moisture, the phenomena what is important is as the uh, pressure comes down, the boiling point of water comes down. So when the boiling point comes down, say for example, here in this table, uh, I have just highlighted 25,400 uh, microns. Now this 25,400 micron is the level at which your typical vacuum gauge, a micron gauge is going to start to show you a reading. Before that, it is not going to show you a reading because it has not achieved a sufficient vacuum level. Now this is the level 25,000 micron is what you get at that point in time in 25,000 micron, whatever water is inside is going to boil at 26 degrees centigrade. That means if the ambient condition is more than 26 degrees centigrade, then the water inside is going to start to boil. But you know, for a system, when a system is under vacuum, uh, of even if it is vacuum of 25,000 micron, you know, it hardly starts to boil at, uh, you know, 25 deg 26 degrees centigrade. So what we see in a practical circumstance, what we do is, we do also a lot of tests and, uh, you know, at a uh, lot of exhibitions like Ecrex and all, we show how the boiling or how the dehydration works. So what we do is we take a transparent bell jar, we put a, uh, a beaker with water inside and we try to vacuum and we show how the boiling starts and how the boiling is taking place. And then what happens if you use too big capacity of a uh, vacuum pump. Now here what is highlighted is 25,000 micron and 26 degrees centigrade uh, is the water boiling temperature at 25,000 microns. As we keep vacuuming, uh, once we reach around 5,000 micron, our boiling point of water comes down to zero degree centigrade. Now, zero degree centigrade is also the freezing point of water. So what happens once you reach 5,000 microns, your water starts to get to freeze, whereas what we need is removal of moisture. In a typical system, a practical system, when you do, you're not going to see that at 4,500, probably at around, uh, you know, starting would be, so the boil of moisture is going to start at 5,000 micron, but typically at 2,000 micron to, uh, you know, 1,500 micron is something where you're going to see a shift of water from liquid to solid because at that point in time the boiling point uh, of that uh, water is going to be at around minus 14 or minus 30 so at these low such low temperatures the water freezes so and if water freezes then for you to dehydrate becomes difficult because with liquid, it evaporates faster. With solid, it does not evaporate faster. So that is something which is important. We need to use appropriate size of pump. If we use too high capacity of a pump, then it becomes difficult for us to vacuum properly and a lot of moisture will uh, get into uh, freezing mode. Now, when I say proper size, the thumb rule in the market is square root of the tonnage capacity. So if your capacity of the system is 100 ton, then use 10 CFM of a vacuum pump. If it is 400 TR system, then a 20 CFM 
uh, vacuum pump is sufficient for you. Now, a lot of time you may not find 20 CFM vacuum pump. So in that case, what you can do is you can use two 10 CFM vacuum pumps till the time you achieve say 3000 or 1000 microns. Once you achieve 3000 or 1000 microns, then you should switch off one of the vacuum pump and leave only one vacuum pump running. So that is uh, something which is critical that only one vacuum pump should run at uh, such kind of uh, you know uh, low uh, vacuum levels because if it is two assist, uh, two vacuum pumps running at such low level then there can be a impact of one vacuum pump on another which you don't want so that time capacity is not important important is the reliability or the quality of that vacuum pump instead of the capacity of that vacuum pump. So uh, that becomes uh, important. Then, you know, while we are doing the vacuuming, uh, we need to ensure that we are connecting to the both liquid and the vapor side. So connecting to the both side of the compressor gives us a help in that. And try to keep your vacuum gauge as shown in this at a far distance from the where we have connected the vacuum uh, hoses. So this uh, micron gauge need to be connected uh, close to expansion valve or receiver. What is also shown here uh, in this is this heating. There are three places where we have shown this heat lamp. So I'm not saying use a brazing torch or something, but a heat gun or something can actually help you dehydrate the system faster. So for that, if you provide a heat on condenser, evaporator and receiver, it really helps vacuum and dehydrate system much, much faster. On the right hand side, you may also see there are three things, three pictures. So the one of the picture which is shown is to uh, bypass the solenoid coil. So there are nowadays these magnetic magnets available uh, wherein you can use this magnet to bypass the solenoid coil. So that is something which is important because if there is any solenoid coil, there can be a pocket where you can't vacuum or you'll not be able to get moisture uh, relief from that uh, system. Uh, another important thing in some of the system is uh, use a core remover tool. Now, core remover tool, as you see on the third picture, which is on the right hand side, if there is a core, uh, which is a pin type ball in a, uh, you know, outlet joint, that was actually meant, uh, this joint or this point was meant for measuring uh, the pressure or vacuum. So, it, this pin ball ensures that it is just to give you a check on how the system is performing. Whereas when you are going to charge, use either another valve, or if there's no another valve, then you will have to remove this core and then do the vacuuming and gas charging. So as shown in this picture, so once you remove this core, then you get a real flow and uh, you get the real uh, fast vacuuming uh, from that system. So this uh, is something which is important and critical from uh, vacuuming uh, perspective. Um, once you have reached the vacuum, then there are some tools available nowadays. A lot of gauges uh, come with, uh, you know, Bluetooth or you know data storage inside the system. So what you can do is, while you are testing for micron, you can see how it is, uh, you know, increasing how the level. Um, you know, the microns are breaking. So once you know that with the curve, you can figure out, say if it is straight line, as you see uh, in the third chart, it is a clear evident that there is a leak in the system. If it is not a leak, it is going to have, if there is a moisture, it is going to have a flattening of this curve at around 5,000 uh, microns. So that tail off is something which gives you that, hey, there is uh, not leak, but a moisture in the system. So you need to, you know, do the moisture uh, removal, the uh, dehydration gain uh, from that system. 
So these were something which were not available earlier, but nowadays they are very commonly available with uh, various uh, you know, manufacturers. Now, what you see here are the two different type of uh, vacuum pumps. Uh, so a lot of time when you're using a vacuum pump, uh, you need to use a double stage vacuum pump. Uh, why double stage vacuum pump? Because reaching uh, 1000 or 500 microns with a single stage vacuum pump is really difficult. You will not be able to reach that level. Now, uh, another thing important in the vacuum pump uh, is vacuum pump oil. Now, vacuum pump oil, you need to always maintain a level, a good level of vacuum pump oil. And you need to, you know, periodically keep changing the vacuum pump oil. Now, when to change a vacuum pump oil is something which is difficult because for a lot, you know, a very moist system, even during the vacuuming, you may have to change the vacuum pump oil, the color may change and all. But... Uh, sometimes the color doesn't change and you still need to change the vacuum pump oil. The quick check of that is uh, with the only vacuum pump, plank of vacuum pump means there is no hose connected. Just put a direct vacuum gauge onto the vacuum pump. Once you connect a vacuum gauge onto the vacuum pump and you uh, run that vacuum pump, within one minute, this uh, gauge should reach a close to what was rated on that vacuum pump say 50 microns or 100 microns so if within one minute it reaches that level that means the vacuum pump oil is still suitable probably you can use it but if it doesn't reach that means the uh, vacuum pump oil is having a lot of moisture then you should uh, change this vacuum pump oil so two stage vacuum pump uh, is always recommended and then uh, you it is also recommended that uh, uh, you use the right size of the CFM of the vacuum pump the another thing which is nowadays important is from a flammability aspect there are some of the refrigerants which are flammable uh, say R32 and some uh, which are you know considered mildly flammable but still flammable so I am assuming that none of your system uses a flammable refrigerant but if you use a flammable refrigerant, a lot of time it is assumed that in vacuum uh, process, we are removing the air or something. But sometimes when you are, we are doing the vacuuming, we are also removing refrigerant. So if you are doing that, probably try to put the garden hose onto the outlet uh, uh, of this uh, vacuum pump and take it out to a safe place. And also keep the uh, switching off power connection of this vacuum pump at least three meter away uh, from the vacuum pump so that if something goes wrong uh, then from a three meter distance you are able to operate or switch off the vacuum pump safely so that is uh, something which is um, uh, critical for uh, you to know that yes uh, you know while selecting the vacuum pump and managing the vacuum pump uh, this is something which is important and even if it is non-flammable, you know, it is always good to keep, you know, if you are not using a garden hose, then keep a good ventilation around the system where you're vacuuming. Because even if it is 134A, a lot of 134A and oil will uh, try to escape from this uh, vacuum pump. So if you are uh, keeping a fan uh, near this area is uh, always going to give you an advantage. Now we come to another important aspect from pre-commissioning to commissioning, which is gas charging. Gas charging is very, very important. Uh, and doing the appropriate or the right charge is very important because if it is under charge or over charge, you're going to have real tough time in the system. So, and these days, uh, since a lot of systems will not have liquid receiver, so if there's no liquid receiver means the system is critically charged. Now a critically charged system means any loss of a refrigerant is going to have a very high uh, you know, impact on the system performance. Now there are various ways of gas charging. Uh, volumetric gas charging which used to be the earlier the only way to do uh, the gas charging then by weight and then also a lot of time it is done by side glass 
uh, then charging according to the system performance, electronic charging machines, and then there are two ways to charge is liquid and vapor charging. So we'll try to cover uh, all of these uh, charging methods. Now this is something, uh, a pictorial of a volumetric uh, uh, charging scale. So some of you might have seen in some institute or I don't know if some of you uh, may have that in your facility also. So this used to be something wherein you will put the gas into the cylinder, then the cylinder will have temperature level readings. So you adjust that to the ambient condition, ambient temperature, so that it uh, compensates for the change of density of the refrigerant as compared to temperature. And then you transfer that whole amount into the system. So that used to be the volumetric wherein you know, a lot of times the challenges used to happen because of the quality uh, or the cleanliness inside and uh, temperature adjustments. And now with so many refrigerants coming up, it becomes really difficult to do the volumetric charging. So what people normally do is use a mask, which is by wave charging. So putting a refrigerant cylinder on a charging scale and then measuring how much refrigerant is taken out from the cylinder gives you a very good, easy and quick charging way uh, for refrigerant and normally it is very appropriate. Uh, you know, if a system is not uh, getting topped up, if you are doing a fresh charge, this is the way you can do. And this is the way I would recommend you to charge by weight. But if there is a small leak and you have addressed that leak, and now you need to top up the system without removing the entire gas. Then by weight you can't charge because you have no idea whether uh, how much was the quantity which uh, you lost it uh, from that system. So in that case what you need to do is use other method. You can't use volumetric or mass. Now what are those methods? You know one of the traditionally used method was a uh, seeing bubbles uh, on a uh, you know a liquid line. If you see a bubble on a liquid line, that means there is not enough liquid, and then you would say, hey, it is under charge. As the bubbles starts to disappear, then you would say it is critically charged. So yes, for older systems, uh, that was the case. Now with today's system, it becomes difficult because there are a lot of parameters. So we don't really rely 100% on this type of system. If you have any system wherein it is recommended by OEM to charge by side class, do that. Otherwise, try to avoid and try to charge by other method, which is normally more appropriate, which is by system performance. Now, in a system performance, there are two things which are important. Now, whenever there is uh, a system which is with a adjustable superheat type of expansion valve. That means you're talking of electronic expansion valve or thermostatic expansion valve. In that type of expansion valves, what you need to look out from the system is on the subcooling, which is the condenser outlet uh, subcooling. And when there is uh, a fixed orifice type, a capillary tube or a orifice type, uh, kind of a uh, expansion device, then you need to look for a superheat. So actually superheat gives you a better idea and control of uh, appropriate refrigerant charging. But in thermostatic expansion valves and all, uh, you can't measure that because the expansion valve orifice is very to ensure you're managing the superheat. So in that case, uh, subcooling gives you a better idea uh, of uh, whether uh, you, know, you have achieved the appropriate charge or not. So yes, uh, you know, this is something wherein, you know, if you want to do that, probably it requires some skill and some, uh, in some cases, some softwares as well. But yes, there are some charts also available with a lot of OEMs, uh, which I use for, uh, you know, calculating what would be the appropriate uh, subcooling or superheat at uh, various uh, temperature conditions for any specific chiller. So yes, this is again a very important aspect. Then is the electronic charging machines 
these electronic charging machines are the charging machines which are normally used uh, by OEMs or by workshops. So in this, the vacuum pump and the charging scales are integrated and you charge by weight. So first you vacuum and then charge by weight through these charging machines. So you don't actually run the system, you just charge it uh, without that. Now, when we talk of uh, ways of refrigerant charging, there are two typical ways, uh, vapor charging and uh, liquid charging. So in uh, vapor charging, uh, what you're doing is you're taking vapor from the cylinder. Now, if you're taking vapor from the cylinder, imagine uh, if you need to charge large quantity from the cylinder. As you start to take vapor uh, from the cylinder, the liquid is trying to boil off. And when it is going to boil off, it is going to be at lower temperature. So what you will essentially see is frosting on the cylinder. So the pressure inside the cylinder will come down drastically and charging is going to stop. So for a vapor charging, normally it is done if you are doing a final optimization. That means if you have, you know, uh, in grams or in uh, less than one kg or something, when you are uh, charging or topping up, then it is recommended to use vapor because you can control it better. Uh, whereas if you need to do a large uh, top up, a large charging, then you need to use uh, liquid. Now, the disadvantage of using liquid, uh, in this case, we have shown liquid where we have shown this cylinder upside down. Now in the challenge is if you're using liquid uh, and you're uh, you know doing it while running off a system say if it's top up then you can't let liquid reach the compressor because the compressor is going to get damaged because your compressor cannot take liquid it can just take vapor. So then these uh, type of small uh, what tool what you're seeing on the left hand side is the blend vaporizer. So these type of tools are available, which you can put across onto the cylinder outlet. So what this blend vaporizer would have is an orifice. Now this orifice will ensure that only metered quantity of the gas uh, in liquid form, uh, refrigerant in liquid form gets uh, out from the cylinder and it, that limited quantity will vaporize before it reaches the compressor. So that is something which is important. Yes, it makes sure because if you are taking liquid from the cylinder, that means the cooling of the cylinder uh, is not happening. So your pressure in the cylinder normally gets maintained and you are able to do a, a decent to large as well as a small charging with liquid uh, charging. Leak testing, uh, another uh, important aspect. So if it is uh, uh, leak testing is uh, if the refrigerant charging is done and you have not, you know, towards the end, you have not again done a leak test. And if the system, any of the, even the valve or the shredder core starts to leak, there the challenge starts. So in leak, as the leak starts, the first is what you're going to lose is the refrigerant. The second is a repair cost will continue to increase as you're uh, reaching the higher uh, or spending more time. Then at some time when the, all the buffer refrigerant escapes, then your performance starts to deteriorate. So your energy cost, cost also comes in. And after energy cost, the actual consequential loss also starts to appear as you're not able to achieve the temperature. So there are various costs associated with the leak. Uh, there are some of it which is mentioned here. So I am skipping those and coming uh, quickly to these common leak points. Uh, you should always check even after vacuum and uh, pressure test, after check, uh, you know, doing the gas charging, check for leak uh, at the, all the flare joints and all of these glands which are there on the uh, compressor connections as well as uh, the shredder walls which may be there on your coil or uh, maybe on receiver so these are something which are important there are a lot of uh, tools or some things which are available which gives you an indication that there is a leak in the system this 
<coughs> sorry this chart talks about how that uh, uh, you know uh, when that kind of a system give you an indication of leak so as you see the yellow is the line when the refrigerant buffer is leaking out and then the performance starts to deteriorate and then is the uh, temperature not maintained so you are not able to get the capacity now as the temperature alarms uh, that is the first indication or the most crudest indication of the leak uh, some of the systems may have a uh, some of the chillers may have a inbuilt liquid line bubble detector so if there is a uh, you know liquid line bubble detector that means all the li uh, receiver liquid has uh, been lost and now there would be bubble on the liquid line so that means that detector uh, you would be able to start to get sensing as the performance starts to reduce uh, there are also simple liquid level uh, alarm so you know that simple liquid level alarm of a receiver what it does is it checks for the liquid level if it doesn't find the liquid level uh, the uh, in the appropriate position then it gives you an alarm a lot of time the liquid level varies with a lot of conditions of the uh, system so what essentially you need is an intelligent liquid level monitor these intelligent liquid level monitors are really expensive so some of the chiller manufacturers go for it but a lot of them go for a simple level uh, liquid level leak alarm there is also another important thing which is atmospheric monitor uh, which you can use which gives you a very very early warning because as the refrigerant leaks out uh, the refrigerant is sensed or detected in air uh, even to a level of just 1 ppm and then you come to know that there is a leak in this chiller 1, 2 or 3 and all so this also becomes very very important and uh, in some geography it is by regulation so all mechanical rooms from a safety perspective because the operator need to work in a safe environment so from that perspective refrigerant monitors are mandatory in a lot of geographies in india a lot of government uh, contracts say for example uh, airports or metros they would always have uh, you know refrigerant leak monitoring system in their uh, uh, plant rooms but uh, yes this is also getting uh, more popular uh, now in India as well so when we talk of leak detection uh, so there is leak monitoring which is area monitors or a performance monitors or liquid level monitors which are just indirect way of finding leaks and then is leak localization wherein you know if you know there is a leak in the system and you need to pinpoint where is the leak then you look for leak localization which is kind of a sub solution which is say a leak locator which is shown here or you can use electron leak detector which is again shown here or ultrasonic leak detector or a uv dye sometimes people also use uv dye so you inject this uv dye into the system and wherever there is a leak uh, the color will come out so you can find out a very minor leak with this color through a uv lamp so these are some of the tools which are required and which are used for uh, leak detection so thank you thank you very much uh, i'm sorry i took course uh, so let me uh, quickly reach out to uh, so this is my uh, youtube page so if you want any of the my videos uh, probably you can reach out to this uh, my youtube page which is youtube.com slash c for channel slash couple single so here you can find uh, all these videos so let